Well, by now you have heard the number, $142,000 a year. That's what your state lawmakers are making now that they have voted themselves a massive $32,000 pay raise. But some are making even more, a lot more. So we confronted them because you paid for it. If $142,000 a year sounds like a big bite out of the taxpayer pie. I'm opposed to salary increase. To me, it's shocking. We've got the icing on the cake. Some of the top names in both the Senate and Assembly are getting even more. They get a five-figure leadership stipend as well. Whether it's stipends or whether it's just increase in salary, we're, we're already paid uh, well enough. Four years ago, when the now defunct Legislative Pay Raise Commission gave lawmakers a $30,000 pay raise, their first of two such pay raises, the deal was contingent on stipends being eliminated. And they were, but not for everyone. By law, 15 people still have them. The Assembly Speaker and Senate Majority Leader topped that list. They each got an extra 41.5. Add that to their new $142,000 salary. I'll do the math for you. They each take in $183,500 a year. That's almost 10 grand more than a member of Congress. The Minority Leader of each House makes an extra 34.5 for a total of $176,500 a year. Will Barclay is the Assembly Minority Leader. Is there any thought to possibly getting rid of the stipend? that leaders get? Right. Well, being a leader, I mean, Mrs. Barkley might not be happy with me advocating, but certainly we don't need to be paid what we're paid as legislators in New York, whether it's leaders or just the general salary. Jeffrey Dinowitz gets $18,000 extra as the chair of the Assembly Codes Committee. He didn't have much to say when I asked him about it. Any worry that that's an excessive amount, that stipend, on top of the $142,000? No. With a little prodding, he offered this. The Pay Commission a few years ago changed the rules in terms of who gets a stipend. That was their decision, and uh, we abide by their decision. Edward Ra gets one of the smallest stipends, a mere $20,500, as the ranking minority member of the Assembly Ways and Means Committee. Any problem with the optic of that, of getting a stipend on top of that $142,000? Um, well, look, we... I think when they changed the stipends, there used to be tons of them. People got them for really doing nothing. Um, there's a very sm few amount that still get them. Uh, I think all the people that still get them do a lot of extra work. None of these leaders is obligated to take the extra cash. I just sent my annual note to Tom DiNapoli saying, please don't send me the stipend. It's not that hard to turn it down. Liz Krueger is the chair of the powerful Senate Finance Committee. That entitles her to a $34,000 stipend, to which she says no thanks. I never want to make any decision as an elected official that I'm not making because I believe it's in the right and best interests of my district and 20 million New Yorkers not make a decision because my salary depends on it. So I realize, nope, I just don't believe in stipends. I won't take it. But 14 others do for a grand total of $390,500 a year. Money that could go a long way, say, in the hands of a local nonprofit. You would consider giving up the stipend? I'd be open to lowering our salary. Uh, giving up the stipend or lowering our salary. Here's a question for you. Do you have a young adult in your family? The $41,500 stipend for the two House leaders is $1,000 more than the national median salary for 25 to 34-year-olds. Meantime, the Senate and Assembly want to be ready to go virtual if need be. They held a hearing today on video conferencing their proceedings. The lone witness appeared via video conference. Rachel Foss of reInvent Albany saying the public access is key. Where public comment is allowed, members of the public must be able to testify remotely. This will make public hearings much more accessible for the public who have often been required to attend in person. We are living in modern times. Um, as Senator Scoof has rightly pointed out, uh, the video conferencing and the changes came about because of COVID. And like any other process, we've learned an awful lot along the way, um, with the focus being primarily on making sure the public has full access and government has full transparency. We're joined by... Both houses would have to okay the use of video conferencing, as was done during the pandemic. It would not replace in-person attendance, or at least it shouldn't, but it would allow members to join in remotely in case of something like sickness. It's not always just about the money. Sometimes it's the principle. That's why we were stunned when we found this. Take a look. A member of the assembly plugging his electric vehicle into a standard outlet in the assembly parking area under the Capitol. There's the outlet right there doing that instead of paying to use one of the EV charging stations there. Why should you care? 
because you paid for it. A summit Harvey Epstein of Manhattan has apparently never seen an outlet he didn't like. We have photos from different occasions of him using an adapter to plug his electric car into a standard outlet instead of using one of the charging stations in the assembly parking lot. Those stations are pay to use. The outlet is free to the car owner, but it's costing the state of New York, meaning you and I are paying for the charge. I tracked down Harvey Epstein outside of a committee meeting. Uh, you seem to ignore the pay to use charging stations for your car and charge your car in a public outlet on the taxpayer's dime. But I'm just wondering why. I use the pay to use charging stations every day. And sometimes when there's no chargers, I use the other charger. But 90% of the time, I use the chargers, the pay to use chargers. How much does it cost to charge the car? Not very much, just dollars a day. It's the principle, the optic. I totally understand the concern. And I'm happy to stop doing it. Not only is Epstein making you pay for his electricity, but he's putting in for mileage reimbursement. We obtained his expense submissions for the first three months of the year through the Freedom of Information Law. And there it is. Six different submissions for mileage, about 200 bucks a pop for driving from Manhattan to Albany and back. A total of about $1,200. You're paying it, even though you're also paying to charge his car for him while he's here. As we continue to press him, he seemed to see the error of his ways. Yeah, I totally understand it, and I'm glad you brought it to my attention. And I don't want to have bad optics about that. But at the same time, I don't know how you charge a car if they're all being used all the time. Okay. So are you going to rethink doing that from here on out? I think it doesn't make any sense for me to do it going forward. The bottom line, Epstein says his days of charging you for a charge are over. We will keep our eye on the charging situation. We have not seen any other lawmakers using public outlets in that parking area. Only Mr. Epstein. As the Thruway Authority prepares to raise your tolls at the start of the new year, we've learned the authority is also raising the salaries of its top officials. Coming to a toll plaza near you, a thruway toll hike. The thruway authority says a toll increase or adjustment as they like to call it is needed to keep up with highway maintenance, but we've discovered it's also needed to maintain salary increases for the top thruway brass. The thruway budget is a hefty budget. They have a lot of money in there. They can they can work with what they got. They should be looking to cut tolls, but if they don't want to cut tolls, they certainly shouldn't be raising tolls. Cases in point and combing through public salary records for 2020 and 2021, we find Thruway Chief of Staff Matthew Trapasso went from a salary of 145,000 to 175,000, 30 grand or 20 percent more in just one year. Director of Maintenance and Operations James Constellid was making 167,000 in 2020, 188 grand the next year, a nice $21,000 or 13% bump. Compare those numbers to the average salary hike for New Yorkers last year. According to salary.com, it was 4%. If money is so tight, why are top officials getting raises? We went straight to acting Thruway Executive Director Frank Hoare to ask about the salary hikes that come as the Thruway is raising tolls. The average raise in New York State is about 4% a year, but these are 20 or 15% raises. Well, the people who got those raises were people who changed jobs, got significant responsibilities, uh, became department heads, and they were in line with every other uh, agency and authority in terms of what is spent on, again, to get the best and the brightest. Yeah, but do you see the, the optic of, of asking for money to, to raise tolls while you're also raising salaries? Yes, well, I hate the idea that uh, we have to pay overtime, that we have to pay higher for salaries. I would prefer we not. There's more. There's Jamie Barbas, the project coordinator on the relatively new Mario M. Cuomo Bridge, part of the thruway system. She makes $350,000 a year, but it's collected a $50,000 bonus each of the past three years as well. And it's not just the top brass. Some of the highest paid thruway employees are rank and file workers who are taking in massive amounts of overtime pay. A bridge maintenance worker had a base salary of $105,000 in 2021, but actually earned $227,000, thanks to $122,000 in overtime. In 2021, records show a crane and shovel operator whose base pay was $67,000 actually made $150,000. A trade specialist went from a base of $65,000 to $139,000. A bridge painter from $70,000 to $146,000. At the last in-person public hearing on the toll hike plan, some were okay with the big paydays. I'm not surprised because basically everybody has experienced increased costs. 
and some were not. Is it concerning to you that at the same time they talk about raising tolls, they're talking about raising salaries? Oh, absolutely. A toll hike is coming, but when confronted with the numbers, Frank Hoare told me the days of big salary hikes could be over. Well, salaries will always increase. They'll increase a modest amount. We're committed to increasing it only a modest amount, and it'll increase as it does for our, our labor folks and uh, MC Management Confidential employees. 30000 or 20000 is that modest, though? No, you won't see that. But we have seen one more hike. Since we did that interview, the acting director right there, Frank Hoare, has received a $6,000 pay raise as he's been nominated by the governor to be the permanent thruway executive director. He makes $216,000 a year now. Jamie Barbas, the highest paid employee you saw there, has not received a raise in recent years, but does keep getting that 50 grand bonus. The thruway says she could make more in the private sector. The thruway, by the way, funded with your toll dollars, but also over the years with government subsidies. One million dollars for one house that's really only worth a fraction of that. Albany County has accepted a one million dollar federal grant to fix up the dilapidated home in Albany South End. The grant was meant for three homes, but that didn't work out financially. So now it can only be used on this one house right here. And that one million is your taxpayer money, so you better believe you paid for it. Welcome to 52nd Avenue at Albany South End. Sure, it'll be nice to restore it to its early 1900s glory, but let's look at the numbers. The home is owned by the Albany County Land Bank and assessed at $70,000. Fully renovated, the Land Bank expects to sell it for $175,000. And there's the problem. Spending the bulk of $1 million taxpayer dollars on what will be a $175,000 home. What? Mark Grimm is in the Republican minority on the Albany County Legislature. The legislature last month voted to accept the million-dollar federal grant. What do you think of this project? Well, you don't have to have a degree in economics to know that doesn't make sense. The original grant was for three buildings. This one in question right here, the one next door to it, and a third building right across the street. That makes a little more sense. A million dollars for three buildings. Republican Albany County legislator Todd Drake is also a contractor. But from the outside, it does look pretty good. He renovates properties. He, too, questions the math. The numbers don't seem to add up, no. I, I've done a lot of residential work, a lot of reconstruction, as well as new construction. And even new construction, it wouldn't add up. Something doesn't seem to make sense here as to why this building would require so much input financially. This is not a one-party issue. Here's Democrat Gary Demolowitz. What do you think? A million dollars to fix this house? A million dollars. That's unbelievable. That would make this property one of the top five properties in the city of Albany as far as value and assessment. Top five. The county legislature could have voted to turn down the grant, but it seems the thought from the majority was, hey, use it or lose it. And since it's not local tax dollars... I voted for it because I'm not going to leave the money on the table. Of HUD and the federal dollars want to come to Albany, I take it every time. This has turned into a game of numbers and semantics. We went to the Albany County Land Bank and spoke with the executive director, Adam Zaranko. It's important to see the bigger picture. Zaranko says redoing this one house is important. It is expensive. Creating affordable housing costs money. We have to reinvest what was just like taken out of the neighborhoods. But the net development cost is actually con completely in line with what it costs to do affordable housing. And he insists the entire million dollars won't be used on this house. He says 670000 will go toward construction, 77000 toward what's called pre-development, 40000 to administrative costs. His total then would be 787000 Not quite a million, but close. What can you get in that price range in the capital region? We looked around. How about this house in Gilderland? $850,000. 729K gets you this spread in Boston Lake and a mere $499,000 for this beautiful home in Waterford. So does it make sense to put so much money into just one house on a street full of blight, a street full of homes marked with red X's that really need help? I think we could reallocate these funds to affect numerous properties in the neighborhood, which I think would be a much better solution to neighborhood blight than simply one project for a million dollars. I think we look at this as a very unsustainable solution. But the bottom line is this project moves forward as is nearly one million taxpayer dollars on one house. If the money goes away from, from this project, it will go to a different community most likely. And we cannot afford to leave any money on the table.
Construction prices could still go up. If there is any money left over after the rehab, it's not certain yet what that will be used for. This will be a two-unit home, and obviously there will be a lot of interest at the $175,000 price tag. The land bank says there will be a lottery for all interested, eligible buyers. Anytime the state spends $1.4 million of your taxpayer dollars on something, it's worth checking out. And that's the cost of a new high-tech warning system in Glenville designed to stop trucks from hitting that very low railroad bridge on Glen Ridge Road. So we have one simple question. Does it work? There's one way to find out. The Glen Ridge Road Bridge in Glenville. Its low clearance makes for a long history of trucks hitting it. And the bridge wins every time. How bad was this bridge situation? Awful. A laser alert system has just been installed to read the height of approaching trucks and warn drivers if their truck won't fit. It's a new system, an expensive system, but is it a good system? Does it work? We decided to put it to the test with the cooperation of Glenville authorities. Our satellite truck right here, it is 12 feet 4 inches high. That's about a foot and a half higher than the height of the bridge. So here we go. Let's give the system a try. As we approach the bridge, here's what's supposed to happen. Infrared sensors detect overheight vehicles, setting off flashing beacons and a warning on electronic message boards. Listen in. There's the first bridge, not usually a problem. So as we approach, bingo. Lights are flashing. Our too tall truck was not too much for the system. The sensors have picked us up. The sign is on. Turn around. Truck is too tall for bridge. The sensors sensed and we were warned of the danger. The sensors have been there since the beginning of the month. I've received four calls on four separate circumstances that uh, indicate that people witness at work that the lights flashed and the truck stopped and pulled off and turned around. So at least on four occasions since Labor Day, it's worked. Chris Ketsley is the Glenville town supervisor. So far, so good. As we were interviewing Ketsley, it almost wasn't so good. Watch what happens. And so, you know, that's all money. And over time... Hold on, hold on, please. Whoop. You can see a large vehicle triggered the sensors and the lights started flashing. The vehicle kept going. The lights went off. Wow, so there's the case where the lights went off, but the truck made it through somehow. So while the new system works, it is not human proof. We have learned of one minor bridge strike. The truck driver says he didn't see the warning lights and messages. Glenville police say they have confirmed that the truck did set off the warnings. So again, even though we found the system is working, that doesn't mean bridge strikes will end. Drivers still have to heed the warnings and turn around in the large paved area that has been installed just for that purpose. Now, for added safety, it appears the laser system errs on the side of caution. We checked with the operator of that bus that you saw that set off the lights. As we interviewed Chris Ketsley, that bus is one of three used for that route for years because the company knows those three clear the bridge with room to spare. We'll keep tabs on all this and we'll keep you updated.